earlier this year, we, we hosted British novelist Hari Kunzru at our Connecticut Avenue store. And at the time, he was on the jury for the Man Booker International Prize, uh, which the shortlist of which had just come out. Uh, and at the time, I kept quiet about my love for the then nominated uh, flights by Olga Tokarchuk, then out only in the UK from Fitzcarraldo Editions, and I knew I wouldn't get a straight answer about where things were going from there, but I did try to pull out how things were standing, and he said, oh, I think we all know which one's going to be the winner. Uh, that they selected Tokarchuk's book as the winner should be very heartwarming for readers across the world because it's all too rare to have work as original and uncompromising and still utterly spellbinding as this be rewarded with such an honor. Uh, but as Kunzru inferred, it seems like an inevitable result for anyone who gets even a few pages into this novel sh story collection, essayistic collage, just beautiful thing. There's a reoccurring trope in flights of a cabinet of curiosities, and that's really what it is. It's a multitude of stories of people losing themselves abroad and within the human body. For many here, this is probably a first look at Tokarczuk's work, but it's only one of many works she's produced in her native Poland since her debut in 1989, uh, a few of which are already available in English, House of Day, House of Night, Primeval and Other Times, and recently in the UK, Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the Dead. She's joined tonight by Jennifer Croft, her translator for flights, and currently for her 2014 epic novel, The Books of Jacob. Uh, even before the Man Booker International, Croft has been receiving great recognition for her work as well, uh, from the inaugural Michael Henry Heim Prize for Translation to grants and fellowships from the NEA, the Penn Foundation, and the Fulbright Program. Uh, in addition to Polish, uh, I first became aware of her translating work from Spanish into English with Argentinian writers Romina Paula and currently working on Federico Falco's work. Uh, she was the founding editor of the Buenos Aires Review while living in Argentina. Uh, she's contributed to outlets like the New York Times, the Los Angeles Review of Books, and N Plus One. And her debut novel, Homesick, originally written in Spanish, will be coming out in English next year from Unnamed Press. So please join me in welcoming them both to Politics and Prose. Thank you so much for that incredible introduction. Um, we're super, super excited to be here. I'm gonna let Olga talk about the origins of this book and, and the background of her work. And then I'm gonna read just a, a very short little excerpt. And then we're gonna very happily take any of your questions that you might have after that. So I'll hand it over to Olga now. Thank you, Jennifer, for to be ready to read because I forgot my glasses. <laughs> um, thank you for coming. This is my first uh, day in the United States and um, we are starting from um, Washington, D.C. and going to, the, to another places. Um, first of all, I should mention that this book is quite old. It was published in Poland 10 years ago, uh, which means that it was, uh, it has been writing uh, even earlier, like 12, 13 years uh, old. Um, so in some aspects, this book is uh, not so hot, I would say. Um, the world is changing so fast so, for instance, it's uh, quite painful for me that in this book, there is, uh, this is a book about mov movement, about traveling, about in being in move on many aspects. But uh, it's, it's painful for me that uh, there are gaps and lacks in this book. Uh, for instance, there, is, there are not refugees, there are not people crossing this, the Mediterranean Sea on the boats because um, 12 years ago I wasn't aware that such a thing can exist. Um, but still, the history of uh, this book is uh, very intimate. Um, I had a quite uh, dark time in my life. Uh, I decided to divorce and I decided to change my life. It is such a time uh, when we are crossing 40s when you 
dream about changing everything. So I mm, spent all my money for traveling. Uh, and then, um, mm, of course, my first reaction for traveling was to, to, to left some kind of memoirs. I thought to write memoirs from tr my travels or a kind of book which will be something like a chronic, chronic of tra traveling. But then it was a moment that I look for a form, how to um, express uh, such a feeling beyond move all the time. And then I felt that the old forms of writing about traveling are not enough for me, that they are too narrow, that traveling nowadays, it's something different than it was in 19th century, century, when you are traveling from one point to the other and you are on the ground, so you are a witness of changing landscape and you are changing your body in a way, traveling. Now traveling is just jumping rather. It is like zipping in the, in the, in the television for channels. You are, yesterday I was in Poland and today I am in Washington. So it's completely different experience. And then I started to think about how to find a kind, the, the um, um, right form for such an experience. I started to write small fragments connecting, connecting with, uh, with uh, which, uh, each other and trying to hum, hang them together by senses, plots, uh, meanings inside the books. And of course, I was devoted to my obsession during this time because crossing the, my 40s, what the, the main obsession was that uh, I'm getting old, um, my body, of course, and the, the travelers as a traveling bodies and this endless human tendency to preserve our bodies from cosmetic medicines uh, till preservation, the history of preservation of, of human body. And that was the starting point for, for this book. Mm, and in a way, this, um, this obsession of, uh, of preservation of human body, the body, the curiosity, um, was the, the fundament, the base of, of writing this book. Also the, the, the idea which, uh, which shocked me in fact, that uh, we know so many things about the outer space, that we know we have a maps and um, books about um, universe, and we know about many things about planets, uh, about all far countries and so on, and we doesn't know anything about our liver, let's say, or our stomach, how it works, how it looks, really. So um, soon my travel became a traveling from such a important places for me, like museums of uh, cabinets of curiosity, uh, and I was happy and I was lucky to can travel along my obsession in a way. So that was the beginning. And yeah. That's a, that's a really great overview of the book. So I'll just read now maybe a short fragment, then maybe another page to give a sense of how, um, of Olga's breadth here of the uh, curiosity that she throw, shows throughout the book. Um, and I'll start with a fragment called The Tongue is the Strongest Muscle, which is about the English language, but also about the body. There are countries out there where people speak English, but not like us. We have our own languages hidden in our carry-on luggage, in our cosmetic bags, only ever using English when we travel, and then only in foreign countries to foreign people. It's hard to imagine, but English is their real language. Oftentimes, their only language. They don't have anything to fall back on or to turn to in moments of doubt. 
how lost they must feel in the world where all instructions, all the lyrics of all the stupidest possible songs, all the menus, all the excruciating pamphlets and brochures, even the buttons in the elevator are in their private language. They may be understood by anyone at any moment whenever they open their mouths. They must have to write things down in special codes. Wherever they are, people have unlimited access to them. They are accessible to everyone and everything. I heard there are plans in the works to get them some little language of their own. One of those dead ones no one else is using anyway, just so that for once they can have something just for themselves. So that, that, that yeah, go ahead. No, so the, the book consists from such a small text. Some of them are, there is one I think which is one sentence only. And some of them are longer and there is a, like a two chapter longest story about a guy who lost his wife for a while and a child and trying to understand what's really happened in Croatia. Um, my idea was to, to, <clears throat> to create what I called constellation novel and it sounds very uh, serious but in fact it is irony in this, in this expression. Constellation novel, this is the situation when you are staying on the porch um, during the evening and you can you you are looking uh, to the sky and you can see the points on the sky bright points on the sky and then you know that this is a chaotic uh, order of a universe but your brain your mind is perceiving this chaotic order in a very special order con called constellation and these constellations are the, the meaning of this constellation are taken from our uh, mythology. So you cannot really see the sky as a chaos because our brain hates chaos, chaos, chaotic orders. So this is uh, your task to, to put an order into this chaotic uh, constellation. And then this is a task for a reader, this book, because uh, I only prepare this like the ba base, the fundament, and you, reader, you have a much, sometimes you are much clever than me, so you have to put your own order into it. And looking at the reviews um, of this book, I noticed that uh, there is no one person who can read this book at the same manner. That every single um, review is different and people can perceive the different things and in a different collection of, of meanings, which is the big praise for me because, uh, yeah, it is a kind of endless, um, endless communication between me and you. So that was my idea from the beginning. So I'm tempted, because Olga just mentioned the different ways of reading, I'm tempted to go ahead and open it up to questions and we can return to another reading from the book um, if we have time. Does that sound good? Anybody? So if anyone has questions, I think we have a microphone that will go around. Yeah. Hi. I have a question about the perception of the book in Poland. Uh, I was wondering um, how was it perceived in Poland, and especially with encounters from people on the street on a daily life, how did they react to the book, and how it has been included in some sort of a dialogue with the current, like, the, fa the fact that, as an example, my Polish friends go to live in the, in the UK, they come back, there's all this evolution in, in, in Poland right now, and how did the people relate to it? How did mm -hmm. this happen? Mm -hmm. Thank you. I have to mention that um, 12 years ago, uh, Poland was in a completely different point of, of, of different state. Um, as you know, um, 
my generation, I belong to the generation who, who was trapped in a way during communistic time. And my first passport I had uh, in my early 30s. So I could go out from Poland and uh, could travel. And I think that for my generation traveling and to be, uh, to be a part of the open and free society was very important. And of course, um, uh, the, the book was very well received in Poland. It was uh, awarded by the, the, the most prestigious book award called Nike Prize. And uh, I think that reception was uh, quite well. Um, and the subject was, very, was also very important, uh, traveling, but... Uh, also, what we as a new traveler, I would say, uh, what we are able to 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 put into the to, to the world, because there is no uh, landscape, uh, objective landscape. There is only la landscape reflected in our minds. So, uh, the book is kind kind of. Uh, uh, document of this, the, 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 those new travelers going out from the trap and looking around what's going on outside. I'm curious to ask you about uh, writers and books that have influenced you. I mean, I'm just curious if, for example, Kundera's writing or some other, I mean, if there, if there was some book that gave you some of these sort of helped spark some of these ideas about traveling and, and, and subjective and I mean, just the landscapes. And I mean, I, I, I have not read your book, so I am, but I'm curious to know how uh, the reading that you engaged in that perhaps helped uh, move you to write this book. I was surprised that in reviews that was mentioned the name of Milan Kundera, which is which I really praise very much, and he is very important writer for me. But I have I, I don't see any any influences from him. Pe perhaps there is something deeper we have in Central Europe, which is makes us as a as a much more similar than I am aware of. Uh, but for sure. There is no wonder that Zygmunt Bauman, this philosopher who invented and described expression of liquid uh, society, was Central European. Mm, because uh, I think that we, we uh, re because of this, because of historical reasons, we perceived reality as a much more fluent and as a something mobile and liquid than you as uh, Americans, English, uh, French. Because for us, living in the reality which is quite movable, for instance, my grandmother, who was uh, born on Ukraine, uh, was citizen of uh, three countries living in the same place because the borders are, were movable, they, they moved all the time. So. I think that the, the, um, the first general thing which, is, which, which could be common for Kundera, Milan Kundera and for me would be this feeling that everything is very liquid, that there is no stable point, points in our reality. And perhaps it um, affects a kind of uh, writing, the language, the, the perception, the, the way of creating uh, sentences. I don't know. This is uh, some. This is the subject for uh, people from academia, from university. But for sure, I. Mm, mm, when when. What should I answer for the question um, about another writers? I grew up, my, my parents were teachers, both of them. My mother was uh, teachers of Polish literature and my father was a uh, pedagogist, yeah. Uh, so from my childhood I grew up in library and I was very interested in books and very 
early I discovered that books are much more interesting than real life. And you can imagine such a real life in 60s in Poland. It was very boring. And as I said before, we had a feeling that we are trapped. So the libraries, bookstores, especially libraries, were, a, were a, the space of, free, space of freedom. And um, I had to mention uh, Bruno Schulz. I don't know if you have heard uh, this name. For me, he invented a new way of writing and new way of perception and description. And his language is the, the, the highest level of Polish literature. Uh, and as a teenager, I desperately tried to imitate him, which is impossible, of course. So he was very important for me. I think that I, with my dark curiosity, I would mention also Franz Kafka, Gustav Meyring. Um, Later, as a student that was in fashion in Poland to read uh, Southern American writers, uh, magic realism and so on. And it, it was uh, discovered by young Polish people as a something very our, as a something very um, similar to our own experience. Um, what else? Um, I've read Russians, of course, uh, especially Chekhov and Gogol, um, who really shaped me um, very, very strongly. Um, yeah, that the names are coming as a first to, to my mind. Uh, but of course, there are more names, and every time I, I answer on this question in a different way. <laughs> Kapuściński as well. Kapuściński, of course, of course. But this is the very strong genre uh, reportage. Um, I was working as a journalist on my beginning. I studied psychology, and from my profession, I am clinicist. So it it means that I work with um, ill people in the mental hospital, and then I. I had I had the feeling that I um, had that I have uh, to change uh, my job because it was too 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 I think too too heavy for me too demanding, and then I started to write in a small newspaper and try to write about small events in my area, and every time I couldn't stand the demands of reality. So every time I put something crazy to this, to my text, and I was, uh, um, fired, yeah, I was fired in the end from this job. So then I realized that I would be better novelist, inventing things, mixing um, uh, the reality and invention. And of course, I be, do believe really in such a um, sentence. The author was Michelangelo, I think, but I don't remember, that uh, perception is secondary that, than imagination. And uh, so we, first we have to imagine something, and then we have a feeling that we, that, uh, that we perceive it. Yeah. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, um, and thank you for that wonderful constellation that is your novel. It is lovely. But every time I would, le I would read it at night, and generally at night before I was going to bed, I was thinking to myself, and this is a question for both you and Jennifer, when you're confronted with a book that's as nonlinear, and I don't know whatever the adjective for constellation is, but if it is, that's it. Um, when you have to actually set your mind to, to translate this, how does one go about doing that? And sometimes I'd read prose and I'd say, and by the way, I'm giving this to all my family, so there are multiple copies that are going out. Um, but when I would read the prose, I'd say, this is so beautiful. And I would say, well, okay, how much of that beauty is the author? And how much of the beauty is you? And how do you sort through that? And then as individuals, when you 
uh, provide the manuscript or the translation, how do you respond to it? I, I think it's an interesting question because so much of it is so incredibly lovely. And you kind of wonder how that partnership works. At least I do. Thank you so much for that. Um, yeah, so I think that people have asked us a lot about how our collaboration works and it's less... Um, involved during the process than one might think. So I have thus far, and I think this is the way that many of, me, Olga obviously has many translators into many languages, and many of us do the translation, and then only when we're finished, send the manuscript to Olga, who is also very busy and you know doesn't need to be supervising our, our every sentence. Um, so I really fell in love with this book when it first came out in Poland and really felt uh, an affinity with it that led me to believe that I would be able to find the right voices for the characters and for the narrator. And um, this is something that I'm thinking a lot about right now as I'm translating Olga's more recent novel, The Books of Jacob, um, which is which is an 18th century epic that's about a thousand pages long, and it's about a, a real person named Jacob Frank, a real historical figure who was the leader of a Jewish heretical sect. And all it's also about all of the kind of characters or actual people around him in the various places that he was. And they all have an element of Olga, of course, who wrote it and they have this and Olga has this beautiful lyrical prose which unites the book and in flights it unites the disparate fragments in this really compelling way that makes it into a novel um, but at the same time she did for the books of Jacob so much research and for this as well I mean Olga is really an amazing researcher and she somehow manages to kind of magically transform that into such light fiction often that you wouldn't guess how much work has actually gone into it but but if you really start to think about the details it's it's definitely apparent um, so right now what I'm doing with the books of Jacob is researching all kinds of different 18th century texts written in English um, to try to find the right voices in English for these characters. There are some in particular that I'm taking out of the novel and just translating, so not as they come up by page number, but just translating their whole character together to make sure that I have the, the right coherent person on the page. Um, so it's really a process of rewriting for me um, and a process of co-creation. And Olga's, of course, always ready to help um, when there are questions. But, but I, my impression is that, in general, you kind of turn it over to the translator after you've written the, the Polish. So. so this is the question of trust. And uh, I think that idea of uh, Man Booker International Prize is very good, half and half. So it's a 50% of mine, this English vibration, and 50% of Jennifer. I guess going off of um, <clears throat> the last question, um, I understand that the title in Polish uh, doesn't quite mean flights. Uh, it has a, a different meaning and I was wondering if that word is something that's easily translated into English or even if, if, if it has some kind of a resonance in Polish that can't necessarily be expressed in English. So the title in Polish is Biguni, which refers to a, a Russian Orthodox sect. Um, that believed that you had to always remain in motion in order to escape the devil. Um, so that's obviously a wonderful way of uniting the fragments of this novel. The root of the word is means to run, um, but it isn't. So one of the early translations proposed by somebody else, I think by the Book Institute in Poland, uh, was runners, and I always hated that title because runners in English sounds like 
joggers to me, and it's really such a kind of banal. It doesn't sound like that in Polish. That's not the word for people who go jogging. So it sounds strange and evocative. It sounds evocative in Polish, and runners doesn't sound that way to me in English. So I was translating the book off and on for a long time. I mean, I started working on it in 2008 um, and was always looking for a publisher, and I was publishing excerpts of it and applying for grants. I got a National Endowment for the Arts grant, which helped raise some publicity. I published articles about it. I did whatever I could, but people were kind of scared to publish such a non-traditional novel. Um, so all the while, as I was working on it, I was kind of mulling over different title options. And I ended up coming up with Flights, which I liked because of its simplicity as a title. So I mean, first of all, in translation, the title often changes, um, whether this is into English or into another language. So just for market reasons, the title is often changed by the editor um, in charge. So there's the recent example of The Perfect Nanny by Leila Slimani, which was originally Chanson Douce in French. And even in Britain, when it was published, it was published as Lullaby, which is what it means, which I think is a perfectly good title. But the editor at Penguin Random House here in the US decided that it, he really wanted to make sure this book sold well. And so he chose a title that he thought people would really grab people in checkout lanes at a place like Walmart. They would see the perfect nanny and they would be intrigued. And that's totally paid off for him. I mean, the book has sold incredibly well. Um, so this kind of thing happens all the time, and I figured it would happen anyway. So I was looking for a catchy title. And then the other thing is that w another way, so I mentioned that Olga has this very beautiful lyrical prose throughout her writing that really drew me in. It's very accessible, but also very beautiful. Um, there's really no other good word for it. So one of the other things that she does to kind of unite her books is build these networks of resonances and associations. So you really feel, although this is composed of so many different places, flights, and so many different time periods, and so many different kinds of people and ideas, they're still all connected to each other. And I thought flights could be a good word that could just kind of pop up throughout the book in different contexts. So of course there are literally airplanes in the book, but there is also, I mean, flights also does have this sense of fleeing, um, of running away. So in that sense, it shares something in common with the original title. Um, there are things like flights of fancy which come up. Uh, so there are lots of different ways that it can spark those connections. And that's why I chose, that's why I ended up choosing it, although it is different from the original. Thanks. Um, can you speak a little bit about the journey of this book? Uh, those of us who do this know that there's something like 25 books written originally by women published in translation in this country every year. So it's an incredibly low number. So could you talk about how you went through the journey of publishing little bits of it, finding a publisher, finding the grants, and putting together the resources to finally get the book out? And I should say also, of course, published books originally written by women and then translated by women. That's an even smaller number. Sure. Um, so I have always felt really drawn to books by women since I first started really reading, but certainly translating. So I guess I've always had a little bit of a sense of mission with this anyway um, to kind of help bring other women's voices to readers. Um, it is harder to do, perhaps. I mean, so the situation of translation is seems to me to be improving in English. But it when I first started translating, I did an MFA, a Master's of Fine Arts at the University of Iowa, beginning in 2001. I was one of two students in the program. No one knew what was going on. No one had any idea kind of how to help us or guide us. 
it was a program in absolute shambles, which it is no longer. Now the program has been built up to this amazing thing by this wonderful director named Aron Aji. And it's so professional and so wonderful and so stimulating for people. But back then, nobody really knew or cared what translation was. So I started working on, I have discovered Olga while I was there, she had published a collection of short stories that I read and really fell in love with. So she was one of the first authors that I really started working on. And um, as I mentioned, I definitely tried really hard to, to publish this book much earlier than what ended up happening, although I'm obviously very glad that things turned out the way that they did, because it seems like the timing ended up being perfect. But um, I first published an excerpt in the Brooklyn Rail. There's a supplement dedicated to translation called In Translation. Um, and that was, I think, the middle part of the this longer story that Olga mentioned, which is um, called Kunitsky, which is about this man whose wife and child disappear on a Croatian island um, while they're on vacation. So that that's maybe the most traditional narrative in the book in a way and um, that's what I started with and I ended up translating the whole triptych and publishing each of the pieces in a different place so one of them went to the magazine bomb and one of them went to n plus one um, and you know editors really magazine editors really responded well to these but still it was just too hard of a sell to people at publishing houses who were concerned that um, the book just wasn't going to sell, you know, the whole book just wasn't going to reach people enough to sell, sell the copies that they needed to. Um, so yeah, it's a little, and it ended up being published in Great Britain, not only much later in the States. So it came out well over a year ago in Great Britain and then it was doing pretty well. And, um, then the wonderful people at Riverhead got on board so it's a little bit tricky, and it's very, very unpredictable. I mean, now I'm working on um, this great book of short stories, as Jonathan mentioned, by Federico Falco, which I think is just such a brilliant collection. And thus far, it's also been impossible to sell it because people are afraid that short stories won't sell. Um, so yeah, it's just, it's kind of like a constant hustle to be a, a translator. There's all of this work. I mean, like I, I run Olga's Facebook page in English. There's all of this work that is not really part of translating. It's not what I did a PhD in literature to do. <laughs> but but it, you kind of have to do a lot of that representation. Hello, uh, I'm a big admirer of your work, Olga, and uh, I read it in Polish. <laughs> so I have a question regarding um, Jacob's books that are not translated yet. I understand you are in the process of translating it, but um, I'm very sorry about the backlash that happened when the book was published in Poland. Um, I was wondering if um, uh, Poland is ever going to be in a place where they will understand how important the book is and how um, it explains the history, not only of Poland, but also of Europe to the rest of the world. And um, what is happening with the government of Poland right now? We are losing everything that solidarity back in the 89 uh, gained. Um, and so my question, I guess, is uh, to you about how the book is perceived in Poland today and if it's getting better. You mean Jacob's book? Yes. Mm -hmm. I even can see here you have the exemplar, the copy of this book. Mm -hmm. So you can look. I have it in Polish oh, here okay. if anyone wants to see it. Yeah. I'm Just so happy the that the book will be in English soon. So. Uh, <laughs> there are more of them. Uh, yeah, book. Uh, the, the, it was big success in Poland. From there was there was also the dark side of this success. But I I, I don't like to think about dark side. Let's say, and uh, it was a really big success. It was sold in 
Poland uh, in 150 copies. So it's really like a pop uh, book. Um, and um, I think that uh, from my perspective, writing about history is an endless pot with subjects. You, you can just grab something and, oh, this is good for a book. Because history, I think that every generation has to rewrite history um, in order um, its own understandings, conceptions, ideas, and so on. So, for instance, for me, writing this book was very important to uh, pay special attention of the presence of women in history. Because if you have the, the documents uh, and making research, you becoming aware that uh, the, the, the women's name are not uh, written down in history. Sometimes they are mentioned uh, as a, uh, wives or sisters or lovers, but not as a, as a person. Uh, so that was my task from the beginning, my mission to to just pay attention of them and to try to construct from these small names and sisters and wives just uh, figures, uh, um, characters, psychological, full uh, characters. And of course, this is the universal history story about that we have to facing with uh, strangers all the time, that this is history, history uh, of our civilization. That every time will be the strangers and will be the settles. And this is the endless story going uh, everywhere, here in United States and in Europe, in India, everywhere. And this, this motives is very important, especially uh, during this time we are living now, because we are living in the times when the xenophobia is something which is against civilization. So I think that people understood this idea undergoing um, this book. And uh, now the book was published just last week in, in France. And it's, uh, it, it, um, it, have very, it has very good re reception. That was a huge article in Le Monde. So I think that uh, this book will go well also in States next year, I hope. 2020. 2020. Thank you. I am in a very lucky moment, I have to confess. I have to confess because uh, just right now I have th three books published in dif different, three different books published in different countries in different languages. So the next, in, in two weeks, I'm going to London for the, my detective story. And sometimes when they, they um, through email, they are making interviews. So I have to be very careful what, at what about book we are talking about, <laughs> because I have to lose my, lost my mind, lose my mind. Actually, I just have to intervene here because Olga has four books because you just had the Polish, your latest book in Polish come out, Tales of the Bazaar, which is a collection uh, yeah. of short stories. So she was also just on tour all summer around Poland promoting that book. So she's doing four books simultaneously right now and trying to write new material. So it's insanity. Uh, hi. Uh, so my question is actually, I wanted to follow up on the previous question. Um, I was very encouraged that, you know, when asked whether is it hopeless in Poland with the, you know, everything that's happening, your answer was that you prefer to concentrate, focus on the, on the positive. And that, that's wonderful. Um, but I wanted because to ask I do that. believe really in democracy, and we still have those mechanisms in Poland. There will be election next month. So uh, Poles are not stupid people, really. That are not, this is not the tribe of, of xenophobes, homophobes, and crazy people. And um, yeah, we will see, but... Um, I'm, well, I mean, you just answered essentially my question. My question was, is it... Is it were you evading the question, or is it, or is it, it's not hopeless? I mean, I'm Polish. I, I, I see some of my fellow activists here that, you know, we've been saying what we think and, and you know, speaking against it. Um, but sometimes I get hopeless. Sometimes I get full of hope. So just wanted to 
and you just answered it beautifully. Thank you. I have a question. Um, I just learned about you this year when I was in Poland. Actually, just came back two weeks ago. And your books, I've been reading now about you, and your books are all based on a true story, or they are fiction and true story together in one book? Yeah, i always afraid of this question. It, is <laughs> that, it terrifies me. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> because um, mm, I, I cannot answer, really. Because um, I think that the, the, the entire sense of literature is different. Uh, it's something which is the compilation of, uh, of uh, ideas, uh, events, reality and dreams and, I don't know, um, fears sometimes. So literature um, gives us a, a special platform for exchanging such a, such a things, such a ideas, and mix everything up. And for instance, in flights, uh, there are many informations, let's say, take a, taking, take a, take, took directly from, uh, I don't know, internet, uh, yeah. Wikipedia, or, or so on. And, um, but I used to take such a fact and to just make from them something different, which is not fact anymore, but becoming a story. And I don't know, there are, that there is such a kind of such a genre of literature based on so-called true stories, but in fact, in Poland last year was a huge discussion about reportage. How far, how how strong reportage is really reflection of reality, um, or perhaps it's also invention or connection, some facts together, creating different facts and so on. And I know that we are living in a very dangerous moment of uh, history, that we are uh, bombarding from, from around by fake news and all those um, bad uh, things. But for God's sake, don't uh, um, use literature, don't treat literature, literature as a fake news. This is something different. This is a very perfect, very sophisticated way of communication through hundreds of years from, from far past to nowadays. We're creating, uh, we used to create a, a special space just reflecting our lives, our in intuitions, and telling stories about Anna Karenina, let's say. And th the, 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 the question about Anna Karenina, if she was real or not, is completely useless. Yeah. And just please pay attention that sometimes we much better remembered and know the um, fiction, fictional uh, figures than the real people. We can say many things about, let's say, Anna Karenina than the, the real person living in, in Russia in her times. So I think that the literature has a special power and it's really special platform for um, human communication. Hi, uh, Jennifer mentioned that you put a lot of time into research before you start writing. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, what's involved? Um, how much actually time you need for putting your thought together or your information together before you start writing? Um, and you can base your information, I mean, answer on, on mm -hmm. this book, but also I'm curious about the um, Jacob's book. Uh, there was, I assume there was a lot of um, research um, had to be done especially since, um, I mean, I don't know how much information, when you wrote the book exactly, but I don't know how much information was available in Poland then uh, about Jewish families. And, and, and uh, so if you could talk a little bit more about it, that would be great. Thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, the first is idea of, of, of the book. And then I, mm, I'm just jumping into, into very special 
psychological space, which is very similar to be in a under obsession. So I'm only in, I'm only interested in facts in atmosphere around the, the my main subject. It means for me that I used to spend a lot of time in libraries, in archives, and I used to do a kind of private studies, I would say. So for instance, for flights, I travel a lot, that's obvious, but of course I spent a lot, I spent a lot of time uh, in uh, Netherlands, in Holland, because they have the, those uh, museum of preservation art, they invented anatomy, they had a sources of, from history of anatomy. And of course, I would say that in flights, it's like 5% of my knowledge what I studied really. But that was my great pleasure and I spent like three years studying this, this subject. And 10, 12 years after all, of course, I forgot many of those facts. I still have uh, in my home, uh, in, in my house somewhere, collected all those notes and papers, articles and so on. But this is the real and deep pleasure that I am very deep in the subject. And of course, I, I used to take what is really, what I really need from, from all those studies. And with Jacob's book, it was a different situation because here, as I said, this is literature. So the mixture of invention, of imagination, some facts, but told in a different way like than the, um, the books are used to tell the, those stories. But Jacob's book is historical novel, very well based on facts. And I was aware, aware from the beginning that this subject is so fragile in Poland that I have to be very honest because after all, everybody can, you know, grab me and ask, ah, oh, here is the you, is mistake, you change something. So Jacob's book is a very detailed base on archives. So even if in a bad reviews from the right side in the um, during the reception in this book, that was no such a voice as that book is in a way spoiled or something is wrong with facts. So it was uh, for me it was completely different way of working, and I must say that uh, sometimes it was boring to to trust facts only. The facts are sometimes are quite narrow and they could be much more you know, rich in a way, then, um, but every time I, I should be, you know, very honest, very strict with, uh, with fact. And I, uh, I have been writing uh, Jacob's book many years. I think that I started this book in late nineties, making notes, um, trying to trace those people in archives who they were. And I, as, uh, as I mentioned, especially wim, uh, women, women's character, characters. Mm -hmm. um, many of the characters in Pravyak and other uh, stories are so magical. Do you think you'll ever write something where the characters come together? Mm. <laughs> That's the, sometimes I'm still psychologist and I think about writing a book as a psychological process, which is bigger than my consciousness. And um, for instance, um, I have, very often I have a feeling that something, a kind of power, I would say psychological power from, from my unconsciousness used to help me. There is such a situation, for instance, I am on, invited to the party to my friends and I'm s staying with a glass of wine close to the kind of shelf with books. And I, drinking this wine, I was thinking about this a special s small scene in my book and try to resolve how it should be done and so on. And then I'm um, looking at the shelf and just uh, automatically taking a book from the shelf, open, and then there is a solution inside. So it's sometimes it's really magical moments. 
and a travel. Writing this book, uh, Jacob's book, I went to Estonia for just business reasons. I had the presentation of my previous book. And then by accident, I met uh, there uh, mm, uh, a, a guy, a man who was uh, from his family very involved into Frankist uh, story. And he told me many, many such a detailed uh, stories, small stories, and uh, which I could use to, to writing this novel. So that was the reason to go to Estonia. Of course, not the promotion of the previous book. So sometimes it's, I like this feeling. Of course, I'm not uh, a religious uh, person. I'm not a, um, I don't believe in magic, I would say. But sometimes I do believe in Freud and his inventions that sometimes uh, our consciousness and unconsciousness are much broader than those uh, tracks we are moving uh, forward and back. Uh, and then we have a feeling that we uh, organize everything. So I, I like to trust my unconsciousness. And of course, the figures, the characters from the books. There is a kind of uh, independence of such uh, figures. First time I had this uh, feeling, writing House of Day, House of Night, there is a very important character, women characters there called Marta, and she's a Mm, she's a, not a narrator, but uh, like a spirit of this book, mm, very important one. And writing her uh, dialogues with narrator with her, then I realized that I'm writing her answers and I'm not really agreed with, uh, with those answers. And they, are, they sound for me very strange and I don't know what she's going to tell. So then she, in a way, became, became for me a real person. And what should I do? I trust her. And she, you know, she took her responsibility for, for part of the text. So that's sometimes very, they should be uh, such a department on university, like psychology of writing, psychology of creating, or, or independency, of, independency of a novel. It has, its own energy in a way. We have time for these last two questions right here. Yeah, hi. Um, you said at the beginning that you wrote the flights in your kind of dark hours. Uh, I just wonder whether it was therape therapeutic to write it and in what way. And, you know, you said that you're getting yourself into this obsessive, psychotic state of mind when you write it. So when you go out of this space, how it is to look at yourself, I mean, what, what, what it gives you in terms of... Yes, it is written in flights that this is controlled psychosis in a way, but I'm quite strong person and I never had, a, uh, I never afraid that I cannot come back from the book. It's always, I managed many times, it's 12 novels, so it's okay with me. Uh, I, and I must say that I like this state. It's a kind of, how to describe it? it you are, it's a, like in meditation, you are very in it, you are deep. For instance, when writing Jacob's novel, I was, uh, I, for uh, some years, I, was, I wasn't interested in any, in another novels of different uh, writers. I was obsessed only with uh, literature from 18th century. I was obsessed with uh, books about Jews and their history and about the second, the second half of 18th century and the history of Poland at the time. So in a way I was closed for an, an, another information. And this is very fruitful state of mind. You, you are, you are in, in something very deep, and then uh, it's easy to navigate in such a space, much easier than, um, than to, to, to do other things, to work somewhere or to, to do your job, like Franz Kafka had to do in the office, for instance. Uh, so um, it was therapeutic, 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 therapeutic. 
uh, writing is therapeutic. To be in a in the interest of something is always therapeutic, because what is uh, bad for for our minds is obsession, egocentric obsession is narcissism. So writing in in this sense always uh, free you from yourself, which is the most therapeutic thing all over the world. Hi, you mentioned that you do a lot of research once you get an idea, and um, so my question is, being a creative person, you must have a lot of ideas. How do you know that this is it, that you want to stick with it and really commit yourself to doing such deep research and write about it? How do you know that the idea is something that um, maybe, you know, it's interesting, but you're not ready for it at the moment? And have you ever um, begun writing and then in the middle of it, you decided that it's not going anywhere? The idea was interesting at the beginning, but as you um, started doing your research, it just lost its interest. Mm -hmm. I have such a novel. It is uh, nearly written, nearly finished, but there is a lack of something in it. So I, I just uh, left this book and the, the work uh, apart. I don't know how it works, really. It is the question that um, I, I have, have to feel to be totally devoted to the subject. That was a little bit different with Jacob's book because I knew from the beginning that this book will be important for us as a, as a Poles and as a European. Um, so in a way, I had a mission with this book. But here, I was completely risky because the subject was risky. Who will read book uh, which is which consists, you know, 116 small fragments and is not linear and it's crazy in a way. So uh, when I brought this manuscript to my publisher, they look at me in a very very strange way and ask me, Olga, it's this is really your finished book? Is it not the, the just the the the, the first uh, manuscript, the, the the attempt, the the notes only? And I said yes, this is finished book. The, it it looks like that. Uh, so they had to to trust me, mm, and I like such a I like such a risk. The another book which was very risky as well was this detective story called Drive Your Plow Through the Bones of the Dead with crazy title. And uh, that was detective novel in fashion in Poland. So everybody, all of my writer's friends, they used to write a detective story because, you know, everybody would like to be like those Scandinavians who uh, uh, earned a lot of money, uh, became f uh, very f famous and so on. But... It seemed to me from the beginning that writing a book only because uh, just to know who is the murderer in the end, it's not ecological, it's wasting a paper. It's, it's So then I realized to put something into this book, which was my uh, another obsession, animal rights, which was completely fresh subject in Poland. And also the... Um, I noticed that there is there are no uh, older women character in uh, in literature, not only in Poland, but if you look around in American literature, I think the the world li literature there is no such a strong female characters uh, old after seventy, let's say older. You, we have Mrs. Marple in, as a detective, and I don't know. Le in Leonor Carrington, my favorite writer is also the two, two couple of such a old female characters. But this is not so obvious. So I decided to write a book from, from, from the position of the old women nar narrator and tell the crazy story. And from the beginning, I knew that there will be that most of my readers would be uh, surprised, at least, and many of the, my readers will be also discussed. Uh, 
and it was like that uh, well, what I um, how I expected that the book was very controversial in Poland and I don't know how I did it because the book uh, became political but no wonder we are living in a, in Poland in a very political environment so everything you 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 write is political at the same moment I think that's all the time we have for questions. Uh, this has been great. Thank you, everybody, for coming out. Thank you. Thanks a lot. This is my first event in the United States, so sorry for my English, and I'm not so... Uh, yeah, I think that the, in the end, in New York, I will be... <laughs> yeah, thank you very much for coming. <laughs>